Forces, tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern on C-SPAN. Right now on C-SPAN 2, the life and times of Alexander Hamilton. We have three panels coming up looking at the founding father. First, Hamilton and money, and then Hamilton and liberty. Later, Hamilton and controversy, the life and times of Alexander, uh, Alexander Hamilton, right now on C-SPAN 2. The Warren Commission released its report on the Kennedy assassination 40 years ago. In September, the Assassination Archives and Research Center hosted a symposium on the commission's findings. This panel looks at the lone assassin theory. This is about two hours, ten minutes. Thank you. In the uh, early days, there was no grassy knoll. I don't know what it was called back then, in the early days, back in 64, 65, and 66. I don't think it had a name. It was just that area to the right front of the limousine, that area with grass and trees, the concrete structure that we learned to call a pergola, the pedestal from which Zapruder filmed the railroad yard with Lee Bowers Tower, the parking lot fronted by a wooden fence with overhanging shrubbery. Over time, this area became the focus of suspicion. After the motorcade's long run up Main Street and the short block on Houston, this area was a transitional zone, a mixed light industrial area of trains, automobiles, fences, and vegetation what seemed more and more like the perfect point for an ambush. At some point or other, <clears throat> the Grassy Knoll, uh, the name the Grassy Knoll was hung on this area. Today, that name carries a connotation of nuttiness. It has become a staple for late night comedians who joke about Grassy Knoll conspiracy theorists. Such a conspiracy theorist is envisaged with wild eyes and long hair, railing to an audience about gunmen lurking in the shadows of the knoll. In a sense, then, grassy knoll theories are seen in the public imagination as akin to claims of alien abduction or of a UFO crash near Roswell, New Mexico. For people too young to remember the assassination, the term grassy knoll is more likely to elicit a smile than anything else. Well, this morning, I want to argue that there's a profound irony in this, a profound irony in the transformation of the name grassy knoll into a label of derision. The popular understanding of the term overlooks the fact that the evidence of a shot from the grassy knoll has become only stronger with each passing year. Later this morning, you will hear David Wimp and Don Thomas relate to you some of the latest research buttressing the claim of a shot from the knoll. The Warren Commission simply ignored the most explosive feature of the Zapruder film, the left backward snap of Kennedy's head and body under impact. David Wimp has carried out a new and intriguing microstudy of the split seconds around that instant on the Zapruder film. And his conclusion is inescapable. The only way that movement can be understood is to see it as an effect of a shot from the right front. My friend Don Thomas here will bring us up to date on his continuing study of the acoustics evidence, a study which proves the validity of the House Committee's conclusion that a shot was fired from a specific location on the knoll. So my role this morning is largely introductory. I intend to try to give the studies of David Wimp and Don Thomas a kind of historical setting by laying out how early on we came to believe that a shot actually was fired from the knoll. Now, there are certain kinds of evidence that have been alleged as pointing toward the shot from the knoll that are not very substantial. In the seconds after the shooting, many people ran towards the knoll 
and then gathered in the parking lot behind the stockade fence. Uh, first slide, please. Well, there. You see Gene Hill running in that direction. This, uh, you can see a stream of people. Um, I can't do anything. Okay, we got a problem with the main lights. Can somebody do something about it? How's that? How's that? Okay. Okay, you see the stream then of people across Elm Street and up into the Knoll area. Next slide, please. And that's taken within eight or ten minutes afterwards, showing the parking lot railroad tower in the background. Now, it's very unclear what, if any, probative significance uh, this has. In the confusion of a shooting, if somebody begins running in one direction, a lot of other people will follow. Um, also, it's been alleged that uh, ear witness testimony uh, suggests a shot from the knoll. Uh, obviously, some people clearly believe they heard a shot coming from the direction of the knoll. However, once again, if you look at experiments performed by the House Select Committee, it's quite clear that judging sound direction in Dealey Plaza is fraught with difficulty. There are so many echo-reflecting surfaces of buildings in Dealey Plaza that uh, any judgment concerning sound direction is necessarily unreliable. Now, that applies to, to, to human perceptions of the direction of the shots. The dispersion of impact debris is something else. Uh, that is the dispersion of impact debris from the headshot at 313. This is a physical effect and does not depend upon a witness's perception. Um, Bobby Harges and Billy Martin, next slide. Um, this is the Alkins film. We're riding the two cycles that are obvious to the left rear of the motorcycle. If you take the time to review uh, what they told the Warren Commission, it's quite striking now. It's not just that Harges was uh, hit a, hit with some brain debris on his helmet and windshield. Both officers were covered in blood and brain debris. Their motorcycles from their fenders up over the, uh, the windshields, their helmets and their uniforms. It's, it's quite striking, the, the amount of material that went in their direction. Next slide. Harges, of course, is well known. There is Harges having just uh, gotten off his cycle. Harges later told the Warren Commission that he was hit such a blow with his impact debris that he immediately figured that the shot came from the opposite direction, to wit the right front, to wit the grassy knoll. So he almost instinctively drops his cycle and starts running up into the knoll area. And in later photographs, we can see him uh, in that, nadir, in that uh, area. Uh, next slide, please. Also, in certain frames from the Nix and the Zapruder films, we can appear, see what appear to be, you see the white uh, uh, mass that seems to be moving rearward across the trunk. We can see what appears to be a mass of, of blood and brain debris moving backward off the trunk. And yesterday, uh, Randy Robertson showed you uh, what, what he believes, and certainly there's, there's much evidence for an actual fragment, uh, the Kinney fragment, actually bouncing off the back of the limousine or towards the back of the limousine. So um, it is indeed controversial exactly where particular fragments were found. But there seems no doubt that the Weitzman fragment was found to the left rear of the limousine. The actual location of, of other fragments um, is uh, somewhat controversial. Now, all of this impact debris does not pinpoint a specific location on the knoll. Obviously, it simply indicates to some degree uh, of a shot fired from that general direction. However, independent evidence from a whole variety of sources is not all over the place in the knoll. This is what's important. 
a lot of evidence, soft evidence, that is witness testimony, uh, physical evidence found there, et cetera, points to a single location. And that's what I think is incredibly important. Other locations have been floated by various critics at various times, of course. At one point, David Lifton proposed a shooter in a tree on the knoll, and other critics endorsed a drain hole near the curb of Elm Street. Gary Mack and Jack White thought they saw in the Mormon photo a figure in a Dallas police uniform firing a weapon. But none of these other locations has stood up over the years. What is quite remarkable is the convergence of independent evidence around a single location on the knoll as the most likely location for a shooter. That location is on the stockade fence approximately 15 feet southwest of the corner of the fence. Next slide, please. Now, this is a view from Lee Bowers Railroad Tower, which overlooked the parking lot. This is a view towards, then, the stockade fence with overlying vegetation in that area. In the minutes prior to the ass assassination, Bowers saw a car circling the parking lot and noticed two men standing against the, the stockade fence in approximately this location. Now, Bowers used a strange term. He said that at the time of the shooting, where these two men were standing, he noticed what he called a commotion. Now, Bowers died a couple of years later, quite innocently in my opinion. Um, and so, we're left with no real understanding as to what Bowers meant by that odd term, commotion. It's a vague and ambiguous term, and we don't really know what he meant. All we do know is that whatever he meant by commotion, it happened there at the time of the shooting. Next slide, please. We do know what other witnesses saw at the time of the shooting in this general location. Skinny Holland was an old railroad supervisor, and he was there at the triple underpass at the time of the shooting. And if a railroad worker would come up and want to watch the motorcade from that location, Skinny Holland would approve them, and they'd be permitted to be on the, uh, on the overpass. At the time of the shooting, Skinny Holland and I think there are four other witnesses saw what Holland described as, quote, a puff of white smoke come out about six to eight feet right out from under those trees there. Now, what's persuasive about this is that we have affidavits signed in the Sheriff's Department on the afternoon of the 22nd by these people. We have corroborating that two sheriff's deputies who indicated that they were told by, by railroad workers that they had seen smoke in that location. What's compelling about that is that there, these are a lot of people, they give their, their observations immediately, and the fact that on the scene, within seconds of the shooting, they told sheriff's deputies this. Now, next slide, please. Holland, this is Holland, a photo taken in <laughs> by me in 66 immediately, with his pals, started running in the direction of the stockade fence and knoll where they had seen this smoke. This smoke. Next slide, please. This is the stockade fence in 1966, and this is the general area we're talking about here. They ran back behind the fence, and behind the fence, next slide, please. This is Holland standing behind the fence at that location. Next slide, please. These are my notes taken contemporaneously with Holland on the site. And this is what they found. They found here's the corner of the stockade fence, right? Corner of the stockade fence. He found these 
he found these three cars parked backed up against the fence with their trunks up against the fence. This middle car, which was a light tan old 61, behind that were a whole bunch of new footprints in the mud. Remember that it rained the night before. And there were cigarette butts scattered here and a few footprints in this general area. Uh, Holland, Holland and his friends found this very significant, but there wasn't much to do about it. They didn't find anybody standing there. They didn't find a rifle there. They didn't find any cartridge cases there, but they did find all of that there. Next slide, please. This, of course, is the famous Mormon photograph. Here's President Kennedy. This is coincident with Zapruder frame 315. That is um, 2 18ths, 1 9th of a second after impact. Here is the stockade fence. Here's the corner of the stockade fence. Zapruder's pedestal is over in approximately this location. Got it? Now, if we look about 15 feet down from the corner, down to about this location in the Mormon film, we'll see something which I think is very interesting. Next slide, please. What's in? The focus is off. Ah. See what happens to us Luddites who <laughs> use <laughs> carousel projector. Okay. Now, notice, notice what we're talking about here. Here's the top of the fence, the top of the stockade fence. This shape here, I call an anomalous shape. In scale, it's the proper size to be the human head from approximately the mouth or the nose up. Notice this vertical shape. Well, that turns out to be a fixed feature of the site. Next slide, please. Okay. Now, this is a comparison photo. Is that as focused as well as we can get it? Great. Okay, thank you. This is a comparison photo that I took standing in Mor Mormon's position in 66. It shows that this particular vertical form is in fact a fixed feature of the site. How about here, where this anomalous shape is found? Nothing. Next line, please. <coughs> Next, geez, it's got The vertical form in the background is the railroad tower in the background. That is in fact a fixed feature of the site. Next slide. Hey, can I ask, why can't we just do it from the... Can't you move closer to the... Well, that's the one we had before. Let's, it went the wrong way. Jesus Christ. Okay. So here we are again. Here is the, here's the shape taken Two eighteenths of a second. This photograph taken two eighteenths of a second after impact on Kennedy's head. And next slide, please. You see this shape? Guess who that is? I told Skinny Holland to go stand behind the fence where he and his buddies found all this, all this material. So he went and stood behind the fence, and I went to Mormon's position and, and took his photo. It's that simple. That's how crude we were back in those days, but it does show something or other, right? Next slide, please. Here's the shape. Okay. This is a, a blow up from Mormon. Blow up from Mormon, and there's the top of the fence, and that's the anomalous shape we're talking about. Next slide, please. Okay, here is the Mormon photo. And let me read to you now what the House Select, the photo panel of the House Select Committee said about this. Quote, the panel did not carry out any enhancement work on the Mormon photo in the area of the stockade fence because this area 
was judged to be of even lesser quality than the retaining wall area, which had yielded negative results. The decision, however, was made long before the committee's acoustics analysis was finished, although it is extremely unlikely that further enhancement of any kind would be successful, this particular photograph should be re-examined in light of the findings of the acoustics analysis. Now, I don't want to steal Don Thomas's thunder here, but let me tell you what's behind that comment. Here's the corner of the fence, right? When the House Committee reenacted the assassination by firing a rifle from the sixth floor window and by firing a rifle and a pistol from the knoll area, they picked a particular spot to use to fire from the knoll area. That's right there, right? Right there. Now, they then gathered a lot of test data. When they compared the test data to the shot the purported shot from the knoll that was studied, that is, the sound impulse that was found on the DPD tape, they found that they had to change marginally the position of the sound reception source, the motorcycle. The motorcycle was not exactly at where a microphone had been. So they had to, to determine that the sound reception source was about four feet from a microphone. But now you're asking, well, what about the sound giving source, right? To wit, the firing point. They determined that the firing point was not there, but there. That seems to me to be an extraordinarily, an extraordinarily um, powerful indication that this convergence of, quote, soft evidence, that is, what Bowers sees, what, what uh, Holland and his friends see, plus what's evident in the, in the Mormon photograph, is uh, once again right on, spot on, corroborated by an obscure sound impulse which is, was studied 10 years after all, independently, 10 years after all of this was discovered. In short then, there's a remarkable convergence of evidence concerning not just a shot from the knoll from some shadowy corner, but the exact location of a shot from the knoll. It doesn't lead, the evidence doesn't lead to various locations and to various battles over which location is correct. Rather, it leads to one single unambiguous location. However, Perhaps the most intriguing evidence of a shot from the right front is found in the Zapruder film. And I'm not going to show it to you, <laughs> thankfully. As we all know, when looking at the film at speed, we see something akin to JFK being hit with a baseball bat in the right temple and bowled over backwards and to the left. Back in 1966 and 67, I tried to quantify that movement. Um, like Ray Marcus before me, I found that what one sees at speed in the film is not one movement, but in fact two movements. That before JFK is bowled over backwards and to the left, his head moves forward. And just yesterday, you saw that Dr. Levy had performed similar um, measurements on the film and had come to exactly the same conclusion. Uh, next slide, please. Now, what we did, I did exactly the same thing that Dr. Levy did. Here are two fixed points, A and B, on the limousine. I simply measured the distance between point C, which is the back of Kennedy's head, and these two points over time. Next slide, please. And what I came up with is this. Uh, if you measure from the back seat, you get this graph. If you measure from the handhold, you get this uh, almost identical graph. And notice what you have. You have the, the head moving forward between 312 and 313, 
and then moving backwards, the body bounces off the seat and then starts moving forward again. Okay? I mean, this isn't rocket science, <laughs> but uh, it is something. At least we thought it was something. Next slide. That yields two, then, accelerations. One forward and one backwards. Okay. That's what I believed for some 35 years, 40 years. The upshot of all these measurements, then, is the contention that Kennedy was hit in the head by two bullets, one from the rear and one from the right front, and that both these shots hit their target in less than one-ninth of a second, right? Both hits impacting within one-ninth of a second. Well, I have to tell you, from the very first, I did have a little problem with this thesis. Because it seems like a really amazing coincidence that two shots would impact within one-ninth of a second. It just sounds like amazingly coincidental. Doesn't mean it doesn't, didn't happen, but it sounds like a quite amazing coincidence. I mean, what are the chances that two shooters from different locations would end up placing their shots on a target within one-ninth of a second? Well, it's with great pleasure that now I can say I was wrong. And it seems to me, as I told Dr. Levy yesterday, he's wrong too. <laughs> right. <laughs> Given the very enlightened analysis of David Wimp, I can say that there now is no credible evidence of any forward movement in JFK's head and body caused by a gunshot. The double headshot between 312 and 314, I think, can now be assigned to the ash heap of discredited theories. What remains is overwhelming evidence of a shot from the right front impacting on JFK between 312 and 313. This modification in our knowledge makes it much more likely, in my opinion, that a shot was fired from the location described along the stockade fence um, at the point indicated. Forty years after the event, scientific evidence is making clear what we could only guess at 35 years ago. The tipping point in this case, I believe, has always been the ability to show from the evidence that shots came from more than one direction. The fact that a shot was fired from the grassy knoll and hit JFK in the head is no longer a mere theory. Um, with the very excellent work done by uh, David Wimp and Don Thomas, our next two speakers, I think we can now speak of the grassy knoll shot as virtually a historical fact. So much for the uh, jokes of late night comedians. Now, David Wimp. Where are you, David Wimp, our hero? Well, you didn't ask to take the five minutes away from the board to present his uh, PowerPoint for you later. Gr great. It, where's David? Is he here? I don't know. My assistant came, so <laughs> three minutes ago. We needed to take a five-minute break so he could. So we can find uh, David Wimp. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes right. right. Well, <laughs> I'm a detective. Let me go ask him. <laughs> While, while, while you're searching for David Wimp, uh, <laughs> uh, I'll make a couple of uh, uh, announcements uh, just for, for people who may be viewing who uh, don't know. This conference is sponsored by the Assassination Archives and Research Center, co-sponsored by the Cyril Wecht Institute of Law and Forensic Science at Duquesne University and uh, the Committee for an Open Archives. Uh, the AARC is a small nonprofit organization located here in D.C. dedicated to obtaining, preserving, and disseminating information on political assassinations. We have a website, aarclibrary.org. 
which has the 26 volumes of the Warren Commission on it. it you can order our sets of uh, CDs, which contain uh, many important uh, documents on the uh, Kennedy assassination. In recent years, we have been uh, obtaining and putting onto CD-ROMs uh, a variety of records, including the church committee hearings. Recently, we published a CD-ROM, which contains about uh, 12,000 pages of uh, deposition transcripts uh, from the church committee that have not been made public. We have the uh, full tr the transcripts of the, the Clay Shaw conspiracy trial in New Orleans and the grand jury trial transcript. And most importantly, we have a set of eight CD-ROMs called the Russ Holmes work papers or work file. Uh, that's fifty thousand dollars of uh, fifty <laughs> fifty thousand pages of CIA records that were made available under the JFK Act. They are records that were compiled by a CIA officer, Russ Holmes, pertaining to the Kennedy assassination. Because they were processed under the JFK Act and not under the Freedom of Information Act, they provide an unprecedented glimpse into the CIA. Those of you who have obtained documents under the FOIA from the CIA are familiar with the problem that uh, many documents are extensively deleted uh, uh, and, and may be incomprehensible as a result. These records processed under the JFK Act have almost nothing deleted. CIA uh, stations, CIA cryptonyms, CIA officers, the content of the documents are all revealed. They are a fabulous uh, source of uh, information about an agency that has long been shrouded in secrecy. Um, I think uh, it's not a, a question that has come up here uh, is the uh, dinner tonight. We will have a, a dinner for uh, those who, who are uh, uh, here who, are, who have paid the fee for that dinner. Um, there is a movie to be shown after, a movie uh, uh, on the Warren Commission that is uh, produced and directed by Mark Sobel. It has not yet been publicly released. Uh, it has some name Hollywood uh, actors uh, in it, including Martin Sheehan, uh, Joe Don Baker, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sam Waterston, and others. Um, it, it will be possible for those who uh, do not attend the dinner uh, to also see that movie. Now, what <laughs> is David? Yeah, well, let's let's take a couple of questions. If sure, you have a microphone that we can bring up here. I can speak loud. <laughs> okay. wondering if he would care to comment on that, or maybe I haven't read it thoroughly enough. Um, are you directing the question to Tink? Because he's well, I thought that was, where is Tink? <laughs> now he's, we have to find all, the detective. He's all <laughs> yeah. 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 send the search party out to the detective. <laughs> Did you have your PowerPoint? Yeah. Who's that? <laughs> We've done it. performed flight simulation tests, uh, and uh, he has, as Tink has uh, described, he has done 
some interesting new studies on uh, the uh, Zapruder film at the time of the headshot. I now give you David Wemp. Going to take just a moment to get set up here. this and the question is what makes it happen mm, see animations aren't working I'm, I'm not, I don't know that I'm running this as I should. So I'm doing this, which is all I need to do. I don't know how to, it's not showing animation. Oh, no. Okay. So I've aligned the frames here from 310 to 317. And I believe you can make out that Pierce, his head goes forward, not to the fort, the fort goes back. Uh, the way I've aligned this, I've aligned the, that bright spot on the roll bar that's most in front of JFK's head, the, the front of it, as you're looking at it, or on the right. I've just sort of centered it uh, vertically 
that's not important and for what we're doing and it, it makes it easier to watch. I don't see where that is. What's that? No, with the, see that, the second spot from the bottom, the second bright the spot. Yeah, the, the, the oh, just directly, huh? Okay, there we go. Right there. So that's my alignment point. And what that does is it eliminates parallax, at least for the points directly behind it, which is pretty close to JFK. But then you might ask, why align it that way? I could align it another way. I could have aligned it in the center or on the left. So why should it be lined up that way? And it makes a big difference too in what you get as the measurement of this forward motion. Uh, okay. We've got a phenomenon in the human visual system called mock banding. And as you see, you see something that looks like an edge right there. But there really, really isn't one. This is the intensity graph here. It actually ramps up. You can sort of tell that. And this depends a lot on the display, the characteristic of the display, what it actually looks like. But when you get this, the intensity over here, it's down, it's dark. And when you get a ramp up like that, which again in blurry, up to the broader spot, you tend to see that as an edge. It's kind of fuzzy, but this is happening in behind Jeff's JFK's head in this Pruder film. And uh, that's what that's what everybody missed. Okay, here's some that, that show up a little better. You can see like this one. This is really this white splurred across that black, more as a that would happen on film. And you see, you see an edge there, and there really isn't one. It's a ramp. It's just a ramp up. I'm not sure. It's, what are we seeing? Top or oh, this is what you started with. Yeah, I guess there's no explanation. I'm simulating blurring, motion blurring here, where the image is moving during the exposure. So we're saying the blurring is this way. That the camera would actually move, be moving the opposite way, but that the image is moving this way during the exposure of the film. And so you should see just some kind of ramp up because, see, I'm just moving this across during the exposure. I'm moving this line over to here. So this part over here is all white during the exposure, and then starting here, you get a little bit of black, mostly white, and a little bit of black. Oh, I'm not using the mic. Huh? A little black. And then more and more black until you get across. But this is not this is not the sharp edge that it looks like. That's the point. It's a phenomenon called mock banding, where when you, you have those kind of ramps, you, the visual system tends to see it as a sharp edge. Um, the others are just showing that that its the effect is stronger if you have higher contrast in the two areas. I've lowered the contrast. And you see it gets to be less and less of an edge. And over here, it looks more like what it really is, which is just a uh, smooth change, continuous change. And so this is how mock banding can fool you if you're measuring in this Pruder film. Here I've just taken, this is supposed to be a bright area on the film, dark, bright, you know. And now we've simulated the blurring in that direction during exposure, the film's moving that way, or the images across the film. And this is idealized, but we're saying that we get that mock band here. This, should, this is the transition region, but we get a mock band there and are there and so that's that's your result and as you can see if you're seeing the bands there you're getting the actual distance was was less than you're measuring okay so itec said the head moved forward 2.3 inches but in fact 
doesn't move that far. That would actually be quite a lot of movement and I think very hard to explain by any means to move forward 2.3 inches and 1 18th of a second and then in reverse shortly after that. Okay. So, what I'm say iTech did wrong was they, this, these are centered by the way. I centered, I, I picked the center of that spot to be the same in each of the two frames. And that is 2.3 inches, that distance there. I hope somebody can see that. And as you can see, it's about right. That's about what you see happening. Moving forward 2.3 inches. Now, of course, they didn't really do this. They didn't line frames up like this and then measure. But what they did, I think, the best I've been able to figure was <coughs> something that's equivalent to this and that they took, probably took some kind of average back here for the back seat. Like if you see, you know, you, you watch this, you say, well, where is the front and the back? You can see a, the front there and the back gets a little bit wider back here. So if you, if you averaged on one end, but not on the other, because you don't see any reason to average behind his head, it looks like the edge just goes right up to his head. But this is where the, this is, this is where the mock banding comes in, that you're not really, there's really uh, not a sharp edge, it is a ramp up. And it's just your visual system. And you can, this you can find real easily if you've got software that lets you put your cursor on a point and it tells you the color value there. You can just start at the back of his head and move, move backwards and see that it does, it does uh, decrease in intensity, intensity smoothly behind his head. So there's a blur there, you just don't see it. There's, it's blurring and if you think about it, there's no reason why the film should be blurring everywhere but one place. Excuse me? Oh, I thought I heard a question. You know, the, obviously these spots are getting wider. You can, well, you can't really tell, you can't see all of that. But if you look around, things are getting wider. The bright areas are getting wider. So it's happening back there too. Some of that, some of that apparent movement is actually mo motion of the camera, not of his head. Okay. The whole vehicle appears to be going up. Oh, well, is that also because of motion of the camera? Yes. There's, uh, it, it, there's just no way. See, if you, the truth is, you think about well, what's the position of something in this film, in this frame? If it's blurred, there really isn't one because everything is moving during the exposure. So there's really a range. There's a starting position and ending position. And so, it does appear to be going up. Well, it will a little bit. Well, the the slope the slope of this curve changes as the camera moves. And the camera moves quite a bit between these two frames, relatively speaking. But if you, uh, well, that's just the way pictures work. If you if you pan the camera across that no, curve. Oh yeah, but the camera, see that's showing, that's right. Oh, I'm sorry, I see what you're saying. Yes, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, you can see the camera mo motion from watching what happened to the frame here. But that contributes to the looking so blurred. The, well, you can't really see, there's not up there to, to see that it's moving horizontally too. As, as a matter of fact, some of the, yeah, the slope changes. There's a little bit of rotation change, but Yes. <laughs> well, I, I, I will be getting to that, that very issue. Yes. Uh, and if you see, yeah, well, if you notice, if I had a way to get back without starting over, um, I could, you could see that uh, everybody's head appears to be moving forward now more than it did in the other alignment. And of course, uh, the frames been slid farther forward to 313 because I was aligning it at the right edge before and now they're centered. So yes, the whole frame is slid over in this alignment a bit. But yeah, everybody's head goes forward. Excuse me?
Oh, yes. There, well, there's something right there that we can't really identify. A lot of spray, and that's definitely over his head. But yes, it, his head does move relative to hers, and that is something you can do is measure the relative motions. Oh, that, Yes, <laughs> they do. And if you really want to pick the guy that's the best bellwether, it's Kellerman here. But you can't really you, you can't really see it until the next frame. The back of his head's pretty murky. So this would be the same the same as if you if you took an average of say the spot. You weren't measuring a single point. You were measuring the front and back and taking an average, which would be equivalent to doing the same with another reference like the like the back seat. So that way you would get something like 2.3 inches of forward motion. And I believe that's how they got it. Excuse me? Just a simple question. Okay. I mean, to me, it just was it's staring me. I mean, his head is moving 2.3 inches. Nobody else's head is moving 2 points. In fact, well, I'm, I think you can structure on the car and you can see that. So the only head that's moving forward is Kennedy. Well I got some frames coming up here that will show and you gotta also uh, notice these people aren't all sitting the same and they aren't all braced the same. So that might be one reason if the motion is something other than getting shot why they aren't all moving the same. Well let me all right and I just Aligned it by the left. Looks like that one's not going to run. <clears throat> well, anyway, if you align it on the, the left edges, he moves even more. That was all I was going to show. Okay. Now here I've aligned the right edge instead of the center. Well, You've got, uh, the problem is that you, in a blurred frame like this, you can't line it up to see everything. Well, you can still see you know? the, the, uh, the hat that she wore, it's going backwards. Well, look at, look at the forward edge. Look at the, look at the cap right there, freeze it. Right. Yeah, this edge moves forward. Can you freeze forward. the frame? No, I can't. <laughs> if you freeze it, when you freeze it, you're going to see her hit the pillbox hat she has on, and then when you take the explosion, she goes backward. Well, no, the back edge does. See, I've got it on the front edge. Look, the front edge doesn't move. The back edge does. No, it appears to move because of the blurring. See, look, the back edge here is moving too. The back edge of that bright spot. The inside handle, the inside handle. If you freeze it, you see the silver inside handle uh, just looking at it. Now watch where it moves. It goes backwards. The back of her head does. The handle? Watch it. Yeah, look, everything does. It's blurring. Everything's getting wider, so if you line one edge, the other edge can't be aligned. How the hell maybe going forward? Is she going backwards? Well, she isn't going backwards. If you measure from the right edges of things, she doesn't go backwards. Excuse me. Yes. Well, might be him well, her her elbow is actually moving, and if you watch the sequence, you can see that her arm is moving during this time. Although, I think she may collide with him just after this. I'm pretty sure she hasn't yet. Well, you can see, you can see in the next film, you can see pretty well see in the next film that it hasn't touched him yet, but it may right after that. So if you align them this way, you get about an inch. Looks like a little bit more in this alignment. But that's an inch right there. So the question for which is right is it depends on what you're looking at, what you want to see. And it, 
the trick is that if you're if you're looking at something that has say bright on the left and and dark on the right as that edge behind his head did, then you need to measure from something that has the same characteristics. That's got the light and dark parts on the same sides. If you don't, you get camera motion included in your measurement. You want the blurring all to be going the same. Basically, you want the blurring to be all going the same way. And for the, for the parts that you're trying to measure. Okay. Actually, now we have a chance to two films to measure the limo motion in, and uh, the Zapruder film would probably be better, except that there's gaps in it, and you can't. There's parts where there's absolutely no background references, and so you just get segments of motion. You don't get you have gaps in your measurements. But in the, the next film, at least you get a measurement in every frame, but then the camera's a lot farther off. The camera's a couple hundred feet from the car, so the resolution isn't very good. But nevertheless, I proceeded to do it anyway. And uh, first, of course, got to determine Nix's location. And then the way I did it, I pointed the camera, I transformed the frame so the camera is pointed in the same direction in every frame. And I first did it from the background, just from objects in the frames, which I knew the locations of. But then once you've got the frames nearly aligned, you can use the frames themselves to further align it because they have common points in them that you may not know the location of, but you just need to know their direction. And you can determine that once you have the camera pointing correctly. And so then for the, each measurement of the, uh, of the limo, I just made a 3D vector and I have a plane representing the, the limo's path. It's an idealized plane. It probably isn't traveling in exactly a straight line. And then so I projected the vectors onto the plane, and that gives me a path, or at least that point, on the limo along the plane. And I've actually, well, I can see the aspect ratio is off here, but as a byproduct, you get a stabilized Nix sequence that's not supposed to be so high. So you can see it's it's pretty stable. So and this actually reflects the directions that I had the camera pointed for in the measurements in the in the final result. So here's uh, <clears throat> where I have Nix. Well, you can just barely see it. That's the path of the car during that sequence, and this would be his approximate view at some point. Yeah. That's just another shot of the model. That, that would be Nix's view of the model I was using. Okay, so here are the measurements. <laughs> and as you can see, they're pretty noisy. Uh, this might could be improved some, I'm not sure, but there's not a lot of resolution in those frames. The car's a long way off, it's not moving, and this, this stuff in here is a pixel difference between these points and these points. That's why it's bouncing up and down. Most of it is just quantization error. You only have about 12 pixels difference between each frame. So anyway, you smooth it so you can look at it. Now, I doubt this is real. This is probably more of that pixelation stuff. But you see, it looks generally like the limo. Yeah, the limo is slowing down. This starts at about 292, roughly, as a Pruder equivalent. Uh, the limo does seem generally uh, to slow down. This, the headshot occurs right in here somewhere. 21 is the headshot. And then, at some point, it seems maybe to level out. Okay, so I just you can't do a whole lot with this data, so I just took segments of it that I had some reason to believe were fairly constant and fit them with uh, just quadratic po polynomials, which most of you have heard of. About the simplest fit you can get other than just a line. And then I put them together. I actually did three different fits. Uh, fit 
1 through 20, this would be up nearly to the headshot, and this is it's showing the, uh, a constant deceleration here, but that's just because that's all a quadratic can do. You know, it, this is the best it can show you. This would be the velocity. And it has it coming in at like about 9.6 miles per hour. And then it slowed down to, at least in this fit, a little below 8 miles an hour at the time of the headshot. And then I took the range, this range would be about 7 frames after the headshot. And the scale isn't the same. That might have looked steeper than the last line, but it's about the same. I'll put them together here in a minute. So it shows it decelerating even more after the headshot. And then this would be, this would be approximately Zapruder 320 through 331. And now the limo is accelerating. But it's not accelerating very fast. And this slope here is about 0.035 Gs. Uh, and the reason I find this very interesting is I got a very similar result in this Spruder film. And a limo coasting without any, any throttle or brake or any resistance or friction would coast down the hill at 0.055 Gs. So that's something like you would expect, at least I would expect, that limo to be coasting. Just with no, no gas, no brake. He's just, he's just coasting down the hill. And it's been suggested that the limo slowed down because the driver let off the gas. And uh, my own experience with automatics, if you're on a three, three degree slope and, you, and you're going 12 miles an hour, I've tried this with a few cars, and you give it no brake and no throttle, you're going to gradually accelerate. You know, an, an automatic is not going to abruptly slow down, at least in drive, if you, if you let off the gas at, under those conditions. So I believe that at this point in this stretch here, the limo is, in fact, just coasting and that it must have been braking that slowed the limo down. Okay, well here I put the three segments together and somehow they matched up here, but not quite here, but that's just uh, the uncertainty of the data. But generally we get uh, a downslope, decreasing velocity up into somewhere in this range. These are, the scale is seconds now. But somewhere it reverses and starts accelerating again. All right, what I would conclude is that Greer was braking before the headshot. That's why the car was slowing down. And we're not going to get a real, a real good look at exactly how that braking occurred, at least not in the measurements I've been able to make so far. But then from 320 on to some point where he hits the accelerator, he's actually coasting. Oops, a little spelling error there. He's actually coasting, and that's why he's slightly accelerating. So, now here's, here's the sequence I promised you earlier. This is uh, 311 through 315, just in a loop. And this is a guy that I find most interesting, Kellerman in the front seat. You notice Connolly and Kellerman, they're both starting forward. Right, right about the same time, maybe not exactly. And the question is, is, is the limo braking causing this? I think probably so, but, you know, they're not all moving. If you look real closely, you can't pick up their forward movement at the same time. Uh, but you have to remember if the, that the effect of limo braking the force that actually acts on you is wherever you're in contact with a limo. And the force has to be transmitted through your body to up to your head because it's actually acting. If you're sitting down, it's acting on your posterior. It's like if somebody grabs you by the seat and it's pulling you back. So there may be more lag time depending on how tense the back is, perhaps other factors. Uh, Connolly is actually lying sideways, and he's more or less rolling forward. Um, and Kellerman was actually just straightening up right before this happened. So he may, in, in fact, be accelerating forward 
but he's still moving backwards. You know, it, he doesn't just instantly reverse direction. He just starts, his backward motion starts to slow down. There's not enough here to see that. As a matter of fact, let's see if I can get back and, oops, guess not. I guess there wasn't enough in this one either. I had to cut some of these down so they weren't playing right. I guess I didn't get 308. If you go back a couple of more frames, you can see that Kell Kellerman was actually leaned forward just before this, and it just straightened out, just just about gotten vertical again. And then went forward after that? Yes. He was actually leaned way forward. His head was probably in there somewhere. I'm not sure if he was leaned over to talk on the microphone. I don't think I got enough. Uh, yeah, I couldn't get a, a, a large enough animation to work in here to really see what's happening with his arm. But I, if you've ever noticed, Jeff K's arm also moves up right after the shot. It moves up and down in about 30, in about half a second. And I believe that the, by the principle of equivalence in physics, if something is, is accelerating, then it's just as if there were gravity acting on it. If you're in a, in a spaceship out in, in deep space where there's no gravity accelerating at 32 feet per second per second, which is the acceleration due to gravity, you can't tell if it's, if it's closed. You can't tell if you're in a spaceship out in space accelerating or on Earth sitting still. And so if JFK is accelerating to his left, that would have the same effect as, as if he were hanging on his side and his arm was acting as a pendulum. Um, unfortunately, I couldn't get those animations to work that show that. You can see. You can just see it starting up. It pops on up about three inches and then comes immediately back down. You know what? I could just kill this and run it directly, huh? Yeah. Get an animation shot. I'd have to dig through and find it. No, I don't think I can find it up here. So, uh, are there any questions? Yes. Well, when I work for the House Assassinations Committee, we send a lot of this stuff to JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory right. in California, and they had a a really terrific image deblurring program. I was wondering whether 313 subjected to an image deblurring program might give you better frames of reference. You know, the problem with deblurring is you you have to assume uh, something about the blurring to to actually run it. And and one of the real big problems in 313 is there's two motions. JFK is moving and the limo is moving. And they actually, they combine vectorally, and there's not any real way to, you can, you can, there's enough there to deblur the limo. That's what I meant. Yeah. Would you deblur the, the, the stabilized no. image of the, uh, of the limo. Uh, limo? Would it not give you a better frame of reference to where the president is in reality? Well, yeah, except you can do the same thing by lining the blurs. But, but see, you've, you've, by doing that, you will have aligned the blurs one way or another. So. And the problem with his head is there's two blurrings there, so it's not going to give you back anything. I mean, there's going to be artifacts there. 
in his head because his head was moving independently of the car and you're de-blurring it as if it were just moving like the car. So that's not going to really come out right. Yes? Um, in this analysis that you did for the um, velocity of the car, uh, obviously it's not um, very precise, but it shows a relatively constant rate of deceleration. And well, this forward motion is in one particular spot. I'm wondering how you... Well, the, the analysis I did can only show a, a constant acceleration if it were the quadratic. That's that's all it can show. And and and, and I'm. Uh, it's just not. There's not enough resolution. I don't think you can resolve a little a short pulse of breaking, which is what it would have to be. Yes. Would you restate what you say that we are seeing there? Uh, what are we seeing? I believe that I believe that Greer was on the brake and that either. He clipped it at the end. And the, the question is, why would he break as well? Would, would he be intentionally breaking there, or was it all an accident? And I suspect it might have been an accident. He might have been, in fact, going for the accelerator. But uh, I think that there was a, some sort of pulse of braking there. It, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even braking. Maybe he went for the accelerator right at the end and just clipped the edge of it, gave it a little pulse. I've done that myself. <laughs> David, would you summarize basically in terms of Zapruder films what you find? In other words, starting at 308 or whatever it is, do you see all these people actually moving forward in the limousine? Only, only at starting right about the headshot. They're not moving. Uh, well, Kellerman. Kennedy moving forward? No, I don't see any. I don't see any motion that I can absolutely verify for JFK. Prior to, prior to the headshot, but there could be some. Yes. Mr. Webb, on that, uh, does Greer break before the headshot, after the headshot, or simultaneously with the headshot? Because we have his testimony, both at the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee, that he turns all the way around, looks at the president of the <coughs> headshot, then he accelerated. But prior to that, somewhere between 11.1, 11.3 miles per hour, all the major investigations said the speed was consistent with that until after the headshot, the third shot, and then he accelerates. Are you suggesting? Oh, no, it, does, it definitely slows down. I, I think that almost anybody who's measured has found that it slowed down from 12 miles an hour before the headshot. Um, I think Alvarez had it slowing down somewhere like 298 to 310. But it, actually, if you, if you do the math for what he called for, that's a pretty sharp breaking. That's almost 0.4 Gs. You should see people flying forward. Prior but to the headshot simultaneously or? Oh, no, he, he, no, he is breaking before the headshot. He, or he slows down, the limo slows down well before the headshot. He turns around and looks in the back. But I, what, I'm, what I'm postulating is that there's an extra pulse of breaking in there right about the headshot. That he's, this is light breaking, by the way. And, and what you're postulating is that there really is no forward movement from 313 to 314, that that movement, <coughs> Kennedy's apparent movement, is consistent with the movement of the other limousine occupants, right. and it's not a function of the shot, right. it's a function of a consistent pattern of forward movement as he touches the brake. Right. Would that be a way of... Exactly. And there's one thing I did, I did fail to mention that you can't really say when this motion occurs. At 312, there's no, no headshot, and he hasn't moved forward. And then at 313, he's been shot, and he's moved forward. And so you can't really resolve those two events, which came first. So it, you know, it's possible he did move forward before he was shot. But everybody else has also moved forward in that frame as well, right? Well, you, don't really, you, know, you really don't pick them up moving in that frame. It's the next frame that, well, Connolly, you do. See, is that little twist of his head there? Is that right. is that from uh, breaking? It looks like Keller Greer. Yeah, Keller is too. No, if you if you break it down real slowly, it's that you really see him moving from 314 on. But he was moving back before, and his head, back of his head, gets back against that window frame, and it's really hard to tell what's happening. So he may well be, and he may well be not really moving forward. He's just not moving back as fast as he would have been. Good question. Yeah. 
connection between the mock band phenomena and your talk? What, what, what was the point of that? Well, that the, the measurement of 2.3 inches, well, if you measure, first of all, if you measure with your eyeballs, you're pretty well depending on mock banding. Why do you but measure the light mock banding? Rather, well, why do you only concentrate on the dark mock banding? Which, uh, of course, is in favor of your thesis to the front, where you explain what it is. But theoretically, there's a, there's a white mock band as well. Well, and in, in natural images, you don't get mock bands. What you get are real edges. And particularly at this special frequency, because their receptive fields are much smaller. Well, I tell you, there is no edge there at, at the back of JFK's head. You can, and you can, you can just, you can find that out yourself. It's an edge. It's just a gradient edge. That's it's a gradient. Yeah, and, and what the system does is it resolves it on, on a medium line, not to the right, as you suggest. You fix the dark mock band and, and suggest that it's giving you an illusion. Well, you've left out the, you've left out the light mock band. Well, I don't believe that, I don't believe that iTech took mock banding into account. Well, it cancels itself out, sir. That's my point. No, it doesn't. Absolutely it does. You know, well, if you measure both, both, uh, both sides of it, but I doubt that they looked at the ramp behind JFK's head, is what I'm saying. I think they probably just saw that edge at the front, you know, right behind his head. You don't get mock bands on dynamic edges anyway. You don't get them at the spatial frequency. Well. I mean, they, they, they're key to the size of the receptive fields in the visual system. You can't get them under these circumstances. Well, maybe it's not really mock banding, but there is an illusion of an edge there that where there's really a ramp. Okay. Visually, an edge is defined as a ramp. It's either steep or not. And therefore, if it's, if it's a slow ramp, then it's a blurry edge. If it's a sharp ramp, then it's a sharp edge. And so your language is off. It doesn't make but any it's sense. It's a blurry ramp. Yes, it is a blurry ramp. It's a blurry ramp. edge. It's, it's a ramp. Right. Okay, well, whether or not it has to do with mock banding, I believe the, the problem is that they did some kind of averaging on one end and not on the other. At least you get the same results. Yeah. David, do you think it's possible that JFK may be reacting to the braking more than uh, perhaps anyone else in the car other than Kellerman because uh, of the back brace? Do you think that, that could be an issue in understanding the um, movements here? I hadn't thought about that, but... Yeah, if his back was more rigid, it could yeah. be, uh, I suppose. I don't know. I don't think there's a physics to that. Hmm? Okay, I'm sorry. All right, sounds like I'm out of time. So this gets passed on. Thank you. Almost three and a half years ago, uh, Science and Justice, the uh, journal of the British Forensic uh, Science Society, 
published a study by Dr. Don Thomas on the acoustics evidence. Dr. Thomas reviewed the work of the two panels of the House Select Committee that were the basis for the, for the House Committee's uh, stunning repudiation of the Warren Report and its finding that there was a high degree of probability that Kennedy had been uh, murdered by a conspiracy. At the end of its work, the House Select Committee turned that lead on the acoustics evidence over the Department of Justice, which farmed it out to the National Academy of Sciences. A panel headed by Dr. Norman Ramsey of Harvard University then issued a report dismissing the work of the House panels. Three and a half years ago, Dr. Thomas issued his report finding fault with both of the prior reports, but substantiating the claim of the House Select Committee that there was a fourth shot from the grassy knoll with even higher degree of probability than that that the committee had assigned to it. Despite this stunning revelation, to my knowledge, neither the Department of Justice nor Congress has taken an interest in this. Uh, Perhaps we can uh, someday force them to do so. Uh, Dr. Thomas will now explain the basis for his conclusions. Thank you, Jim. I want to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me and giving me this opportunity uh, to speak to you. Uh, according to the Warren Commission, there was no more, no less than exactly three shots fired uh, at President Kennedy during the assassination, all by Lee Harvey Oswald from a position in a building uh, behind the President. As we've heard from some of our speakers, uh, that conclusion was not in very good accord with the evidence available to the Warren Commission. Uh, firstly, uh, the Warren report states that some witnesses had identified an area in front of the President as a source of the shots. Actually, it was the majority of the witnesses who were interviewed by the Warren Commission or its minions thought that gunfire had come from that location. Secondly, as we have seen, uh, the Zapruder film shows that the President's head was knocked backwards by the impact of the shot, which is cogent evidence for a gunshot from the front. The Warren report states, and I quote, three shots were heard and the President fell forward back, bleeding from the head, uh, which is, turns out to be the exact opposite of the truth. And uh, thirdly, in as much as there were at least four wounds inflicted on the victims of the shooting, the three-shot scenario just doesn't seem to add up. In 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations developed acoustical evidence for a gunshot from the grassy knoll, and that's what I'm going to try to explain. I'm not going forward with this. Uh... There, okay. On the day that President Kennedy was assassinated, the Dallas police were communicating over two radio channels. They designated those simply as Channel 1 and Channel 2. Channel 1 uh, was the primary channel used for routine police transmissions. It was being recorded at headquarters on a dictabelt machine like the one shown here on the left. Channel 2, an auxiliary channel, was dedicated on this day to the police escort with the President's motorcade. It was being recorded on a gray autograph disc recorder like the one shown here on the right. It is by the context of the broadcast on Channel 2 that we can establish and fix the time of the assassination. Uh, and I want to play that for you, I'll start with that. Uh, before I do, I need to introduce you to someone. Uh, this is Chief of Police Jesse Curry, and the voice you will hear is his. He was in the lead car, the pace car, if you will, of the motorcade. This uh, photograph shows uh, the President's limousine entering Dealey Plaza, and in the distance, about 200 feet in front of him, you see the, uh, the lead car with the chief of police. And now, I've prepared this transcript so you can actually follow along with the uh, broadcast. I'm not getting an arrow here. There we go. So I'm a little spastic here, so how do you uh, 
Rex. <laughs> what, enter? I am. The critical part of that broadcast, of course, was the last uh, uh, Chief Curry ordering the motorcade to head to the hospital. So the shooting has occurred. He knows the president's been shot. Just 10 seconds before that broadcast, you heard the dispatcher, as a regular part of protocol, announce the time is 12.30. He also announced the time 12.31, 12.32, et cetera. So that establishes the time at approximately 12.30 by the dispatcher's clock. And just 10 seconds before the dispatcher announced 12.30, uh, Curry had announced that he was at the triple underpass. Uh, if you're not familiar with Dealey Plaza, I uh, can't imagine somebody's here is not. <laughs> uh, the triple underpass is that railroad bridge to the left and the three roads that go underneath it. Uh, this is the pointer. If, uh, if Curry is here at the, at the triple underpass, then President Kennedy, about 200 feet behind him, is in the midsection of uh, Elm Street, and that's exactly where the shooting occurred. Uh, hence, the broadcast where Chief Curry says he's at the triple underpass, that's probably the broadcast by context, which is the closest to the actual time of the shooting. This here is the Grassy Knoll. This is the book depository where Lee Harvey Oswald was an employee. At a most unusual event over on Channel One, and a fortuitous event as it turns out, happened a, for five and a half minutes beginning around 1228 until around 1234, again by the dispatcher's time notations, uh, somewhere in Dallas, a microphone on a police motorcycle becomes stuck open and channel one is dominated by the sound of that motorcycle motor. He is effectively then uh, blocking, uh, jamming the transmissions on channel one. Well, this is real slow to come up here, this arrow. There we go. Where? In the middle? Well, a key question here is what made the dispatcher so certain that the motorcycle was on the Stammons Freeway? Now, the most uh, likely piece of evidence was the fact that one minute earlier, you can hear sirens in the background behind that motorcycle motor noise. The one emergency that was going on was the president's motorcade on its way to Parkland Hospital on the Stammons Freeway. So the dispatcher had made the inference that it must be one of the motorcycles with the motorcade. There were 18 motorcycles assigned to the president's motorcade. If so, then there's a chance that that motorcycle was in Dealey Plaza, and if so, it might have captured the sounds of the gunshots on its microphone and recorded it at headquarters. And if so, then we would have direct evidence relative to the problem of exactly how many shots were fired during the Kennedy assassination. So in 1978, the House Select Committee on Assassinations arranged for an expert analysis of the Dallas police tapes. They chose a firm, actually, they went to the Acoustical Society of America, who recommended to them a firm of Bolt, Baranek, and Newman of Cambridge, Massachusetts. They had done the Kent State shooting tapes back in uh, uh, the mid-70s. 
Uh, in that case, uh, National Guard soldiers had fired at some rowdy students. Uh, later, the National Guard would claim that they were returning fire, that they had been fired at, sh at first. So BBN analyzed, the, there was a video and an audio tape. They analyzed the sounds, used uh, uh, triangulation to identify the origin of the sounds, the first three gunshot sounds, and found not only the soldiers that fired the first three shots, but were able to identify the precise three soldiers who had fired the shots. And subsequently, from the films, that the FBI were able to identify these individuals and interviewed them, and all three admitted that they had, in fact, discharged their weapons. So the same experts were asked to apply the same technology to the police tapes. I just want to give you a very brief primer on uh, what it is uh, that the acoustical experts were looking for. Sound is a change in air pressure, and it is caused when something causes air to become compressed, the molecules closer together, and as a consequence, you also have rarefaction rarif of the molecules. So that a sound wave is a lot like an ocean wave. It has a crest and a trough. And you can actually see that in this uh, shadow graph of a bullet making a sound wave <clears throat> in a smoke chamber so that the air becomes compressed here. And you can actually see the compression of the air. That's your sound wave. That's your crest. And right behind it, you see the white uh, the lighter color, that's your trough of the sound because the air molecules have been compressed into that wave. And when that strikes your ear, that's the sound that you hear. Now, some folks might think that the sound that a rifle makes uh, is caused by the uh, detonation of the cartridge or the powder, but actually it's the bullet that makes the noise. When the bullet travels from the chamber to the muzzle, it forces that column of air in the barrel to collide violently with the air in front of the muzzle. And that's what generates the sound. That's called a muzzle blast. Now, uh, the characteristics of a gunshot, uh, it doesn't have a characteristic frequency because it's a single impulse. The characteristics of a gunshot is that it's very, very loud, very, very brief. The problem with loudness is that it's a factor both of the intrinsic energy that goes into making the sound, but also the distance, which is to say, that a gunshot's very loud if you're standing near the man with the gun, but if you're a half a mile away, then it's not very loud. Conversely, if I clap my hands right next to your ear, well, that's a sudden loud noise. And the problem then is if you find a sudden loud noise on a recording, is that because it was an intrinsically loud noise or is it simply something that happened to be close to the microphone? Well, the answer to that is that clapping my hands, a clap of my hands is not going to resonate off of a building 300 feet away and come back as a loud echo, but an intrinsically loud so sound like a gunshot will. Now, an echo is a reflection, and you know that it's a mirror image. So it's just like if you're in the canyon and you're shouting, hello, hello, you can hear the same word. And not only the word can you make out, your voice can be distinguished from somebody else's voice because the timbre or everything is reflected. It's a mirror image. Well, just as that muzzle blast will be a large, narrow impulse, the echoes will also be large, narrow impulses. And so in an urban environment like downtown Dallas, where you've got these buildings, you should have a cluster or train of large, narrow impulses. And that's what a gunshot is expected to look like. So that is what, something like this, is what the experts were looking for, this being the original muzzle blast, and then there should be a train of echoes after it. That's what they're looking for on the police tape. So they process the police tape through an oscillograph, and this is what you find. Basically, this is mostly motorcycle noise. And rising above the motorcycle noise, you've got these trains of large, narrow impulses. That's what a gunshot would look like, but then a lot of other things might look like that. Uh, static might look like that. So they had to uh, make some additional uh, criteria for screening the five and a half minutes of recording. So these are the four characteristics, the criteria they used. Now, in each impulse pattern should be around 10 impulses. And that's because you've got five large buildings facing the plaza. And you'll get an impulse off the a reflection off the face of the building. But you'll also get a refraction off the corner of each building. So there should be around 10 impulses. But that's the exact number is going to vary a little bit depending on exactly where the microphone is relative to the buildings. So you're looking for patterns about 10 impulses. 
Each pattern should be a quarter to a half second duration, and that's from simply the physical dimensions of Dealey Plaza being 500 feet across, speed of sound 1,100 feet per second. Uh, it shouldn't take more than about a half a second for sound to travel across that plaza. There should be at least three discrete patterns because we, we all agree that there was at least three shots during the assassination. The question is, was there more? Uh, the sequence, the total sequence of gunfire should be at least four and a half seconds, but less than 15 seconds. The 15 seconds, the upper limit, comes from the filmed evidence that the president's limousine was only on Elm Street for about 15 seconds. The four and a half seconds comes from the, uh, the function of Lee Harvey Oswald's ri rifle, the U.S. Army Weapons Testing Branch established that the cycle time, that is, the time to fire, it reload, and fire again was two and a quarter in se uh, seconds. Uh, so to get three shots, you need at least 4.5 seconds. So applying those four criteria to the entire five and a half minutes of recording, they find only one place that meets all those criteria, and it happens in a 10-second sequence that begins about 136 seconds into the motorcycle segment. So the next step was to go to Dealey Plaza and actually fire test shots, record those test shots, and so now we know exactly what a Dealey Plaza echo pattern looks like, and compare that to the sounds patterns that are on the police tape. The one on the bottom is the, is the patterns that I'd shown you earlier from the police recording. Uh, the upper figure shows uh, an oscillograph of the test shot fired from the grassy knoll. Now to the untrained eye, you'd look at those and say they don't look anything alike. There's a reason for that. The upper recording is a high fidelity recording. And as I explained, as sound travels over distance, it diminishes in amplitude. And so you will have echoes coming from further away will be, will be smaller. The police tape, on the other hand, is not a high fidelity recording at all. It had built into its circuitry something called automatic gain control, which was a sort of automatic volume control. It was necessary to enhance voice communications because here you've got 100 police officers or so, and they're all at different distances. They all have different signal strengths. And the automatic gain control compressed the sound levels. It amplified the weak signals, and it diminished the very strong signals so that everybody was able to talk at, at about the same level, it's compressing it into a comfort zone so that no one was having to constantly adjust the volume. As a consequence, it had a very fast uh, attack time, and so it would expectedly diminish the big signals and amplify the small signals. So we can't rely on amplitude. The comparison that the acoustical experts made was strictly on the arrival time, the echo delay time. And when they did that, they found they indeed matched to the test shots. Which brings us to the key question of how many shots did they find? The House Select Committee on Assassinations report states four shots. But that's not what the acoustical experts found. The acoustical experts found five, which is to say that there are five sound patterns on the police tape which matched to test shots that were fired in Dealey Plaza. And the question is why, if the acoustical experts found five, why did the House Select Committee report only four? Uh, well, I spoke to... Uh, uh, this is what they say in their report. It says that the entry in Table 2, and this is in reference to those sound patterns, their arrival time on the recording. It said that uh, the rifle couldn't be fired that rapidly. There were two shots too close together, and uh, therefore it must be a false alarm or false positive. And uh, this is equivalent of saying if Lee Harvey Oswald didn't shoot it, it's not a shot. Uh, So the fact is that they did find five patterns that matched to uh, That was tacky, I know. Um, oh, that wasn't the real recording. That is not the recording. <laughs> that's a good point. That is not the recording. The sound the, on the recording itself sounds like uh, Rice Krispies. It's just snap, crackle, pop. And uh, if it sounded like that, you wouldn't need acoustical experts to tell you how many shots are on the recording. The point here is that the sequence, if, if the acoustical evidence is correct, that is the sequence that is on 
the tape. That's the spread of the shots. Three close together, uh, then about a five second gap or interval, and then two shots close together. So how do we know if we didn't get just the false positives here that these matches are not just spurious? Uh, because of the, the controversial nature of that, that finding by the acoustical experts, the House Select Committee then went to a second laboratory. Uh, again, recommended to them by the Acoustical Society of America. They went to uh, the Computer Science Department at Queens College in New York. These folks were experts in sonar. In fact, they're the folks that write the computer programs for our submarines, which is this, this uh, same principle that we're using here. Uh, echolocation is a form of triangulation. Uh, if you know the principle being if you know two angles of your triangle and you know something about the distance, then you can solve for the third point. And in this case, we know the distance comes from that echo delay time. Basically, this is uh, uh, applying that triangulation to Dealey Plaza. And the result was that the acoustical experts found that the shot that matched to the grassy knoll, uh, their triangulation pinpointed it to a spot uh, actually about 10 feet from the corner, plus or minus 5 feet which puts it right near this, uh, this spot right here. If you walk up to the fence and look over, uh, this is the view that you have, and you can see down here this spot is painted in the street is where President Kennedy was struck in the head. Now, if we have, if these, one way to test our hypothesis that these are, we, that the match means that we've got the gunshots killed President Kennedy, uh, I did a formal statistical analysis. This is what was published by Science and Justice of the odds that this could have happened uh, by chance. That it's something that's not a gunshot, not an echo pattern of a gunshot. If it was anything else like static, uh, there should be uh, a likelihood that it would happen. As it turns out, the odds are about 100,000 to 1 against it uh, uh, having a random pattern match to the patterns as they did. Another way of uh, looking at this to see if they're spurious, if we assume that uh, there was a higher uh, order of chance of that happening and you got, as we did, five uh, matches, then they should occur in random order. And what I'm talking about is uh, because the, ec the acoustic experts didn't know exactly where the motorcycle was, they had to array microphones in the plaza along the street along the route of the motorcade. So they put 36 motor microphones about 18 feet apart along the route. Now, if these sounds are not echo patterns of gunshots in Dealey Plaza and the match is spurious, then the likelihood of getting a match, say, at this microphone is the same as at this microphone because it's got nothing to do with Dealey Plaza. And therefore, if you match five, uh, if the, again, if it's spurious, they'll be in random order. They'll be in nonsense order. And that's not what happened. They are ordered which is to say that the first sound on the Dallas police tape matched to this microphone here. A test shot fired that microphone. The second pattern on the Dallas police tape, second and a half later, matched to this microphone here. Test shot recorded there. The third one here, and then down the road here, fourth and fifth one here. So they were exactly in the right order, one, two, three, four, five. There's 125 ways that you can order five numbers, only one of which is one, two, three, four, five. But it's not just the order, it's the, you'll notice the spacing. There's three shots, three close together, microphone positions close together, and then two further down the road. So that matches the spacing on the recording. And it's not just the spacing, it's the trajectory. The distance from this microphone to this microphone was 130 feet. The time between the first sound and the last sound on the police tape is 8.3 seconds. In order to go 130 feet in 8.3 seconds, you'd have to go approximately 11 miles per hour. And of course, the FBI had shown that the President's limousine was moving at approximately, well, 11.3 miles per hour is the average speed they calculated. So it was this order in the data, not just the matching, that led the acoustical expert to conclude that, yes, the, they had found the gunshots that killed President Kennedy on the recording. We can test it further. Now that we have identified where these acoustical positions are, we can test that by looking at the film evidence to see if, indeed, there was a motorcycle at the places predicted by the President's 
uh, by this evidence, the acoustical evidence. This picture here uh, was taken in between that, uh, well, the shooting has begun. Clearly, the shooting has begun. This is equivalent about Zapruder frame 255. If you look back into the distance here, you'll see no motorcycle, uh, at least for the next 100 feet or so. The acoustical evidence places a motorcycle about 150 feet behind the president's limousine. Uh, so if he's, which, if he's there, he should be back over in here just out of sight. Uh, the president was the second, second car. This is the third, the fourth, the fifth car. Uh, the motorcycle should be around the seventh car in the motorcade if he, if he was there, according to the acoustical evidence. This next picture, uh, taken about eight seconds before that picture, we see that set fifth car in the motorcade, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We find a man on a motorcycle here. This is an officer named McLean. And this picture was taken approximately five seconds before uh, the first shot. So to get to the first acoustical position, which is round over in here, it's about 180 feet away, he's got to go between about 25 and 30 miles per hour. And if he does that, uh, which is much faster than the motorcade, he will arrive at the right spot. And did he go faster than the motorcade? This picture was taken about 25 seconds after the shooting, and that's that same officer. There's McLean. Uh, this is to orient you. This is an officer named Corson. Here's Bobby Hargis, who had stopped his motorcycle, run up here, uh, then remembered, yeah, you're supposed to go to the hospital. So he ran back uh, to his motorcycle. And that helps you orient for this next picture. Uh, this was a picture taken from the 10th car in the motorcade. Uh, here's McLean. Here's Corson. This is about three or four seconds earlier. Here's Hargis uh, started running towards his motorcycle. What this picture shows you, since it was taken from the 10th car in the motorcade, now remember, uh, McLean was behind the 10th car at the motorcade back at the intersection of Houston and Maine. So he has passed at least the 10th, 9th, and 8th cars. He's passed all these, so he's going faster than the motorcade, at least his average speed over that time. In fact, he's gone about uh, 400 feet in the time it's taken this car to go about 200 feet. Now, there's been some stopping and slowing down among these cars. So it isn't definitive, but he has uh, passed up these cars at some point. It looks like he did pass them back on uh, Houston Street. Uh, to put, uh, summarize this evidence, uh, these are the locations where he has, the motorcycle has to have been for the acoustical evidence to be correct. Uh, Gary Mack especially has searched the uh, archives for photographic evidence, and we've not been able to find any definitive uh, pictures that show the motorcycle here or not here. Uh, there's no pictures of these spots at precisely the right time. So what we've seen is that the motorcycle was here about five seconds before the shooting. He was here about 20 seconds after the shooting. Uh, we have a further constraint, and that is on the recording itself, you hear the motor humming along until about two seconds before the first shot. At that point, the motorcycle noise drops by 75%, which indicates that he's left off, let off the accelerator. We think because he's anticipating making his turn at the corner. He then idles for about 30 seconds, which means we, have to, we require that he goes faster here uh, than after the shooting. So if we assume that he went 25 to 30 miles per hour here, slowed to about 15 miles per here, slowed idling now, slowing down to about five miles per hour here, which therefore meets the requirement that he's traveling about 11 miles per hour between those two points, and then continues to idle here uh, for at about five miles per hour, then he will be at just the right spots, which the filmed evidence shows uh, he was at. No other motorcycle in the motorcade could have been at the right place at the right time. Uh, subsequently, McLean was interviewed and he stated that he did have a problem with a microphone uh, that would stick open. If the acoustical matches are, are not the gunshots, then there's no reason for them to occur at the time, exactly at the time of the assassination, in that five and a half minutes. In other words, what we're saying is, we remember we've got two separate recordings. On channel one, we have the sounds uh, which the acoustical experts have identified as the gunshots. Over on channel two, 
we have that broadcast by Chief Curry where he says he's at the triple underpass, which should be the broadcast closest to the time of the shooting. If, if these are the gunshots that killed President Kennedy, those should be simultaneous. So what we need is somewhere on the recording, we need a simulcast so that we can uh, correlate those two events, see if they're synchronous or not. Uh, it turns out there's no less than five different simulcasts, broadcasts that are common to both channels. Uh, and so it ought to be easy to synchronize things. But as it turns out, as you see here, uh, uh, if it were true that you could rely on these to synchronize events, then each of these events should be d separated by the same amount of time. And as you can see here, they're not. They're all different. Uh, the reason for that is because the, one of the reasons, there are several reasons, one of the reasons is that the recordings were sound actuated. In order to save uh, time on the recordings, uh, whenever there was dead air, they'd stop recording. So, it, and then uh, when somebody would broadcast, it was sound actuated to start recording again. Uh, so it's not real time on the recordings. Uh, there's other problems that have to do with tape speed and with the uh, fact that these are stylus and groove arrangements and there was some skipping and repeating going along. Uh, the National Research Council uh, used one uh, recording and used that, claimed that was the synchronization, uh, made very little effort to, uh, to uh, figure out why these why you have these discrepancies in the timing and reach the conclusion that uh, the two events were not synchronous. However, if we re use a different time, let's go back and use the simulcast, which is actually the closest one to the time of the shots, which is when uh, Fisher, Deputy Chief Fisher says, I'll check it. That happens just two seconds before Chief Curry said he's at the triple underpass. And now I will actually pay, play for you the Channel 1 recording. And as I said, the, the sounds that sound like gunshots are going to sound like uh, just a static, snap, crackle, pop. But we can, what I use, I use that broadcast by Chief Fisher where he says, I'll check it to actually find them on the recording. Here we go. Play that again so you can hear that sequence again. So if you use that, if you use that that uh, simulcast closest to the time of the shooting, so you have less effect of these other problems causing the time discrepancies, you get an exact synchronization between the, the time when these sounds were deposited on the recording and when President Kennedy was actually assassinated. Now, the obvious thing to do is to take the audio and match it up to the video. Remember, you've got this uh, uh, obvious event at frame 313 where the President Kennedy's head is ruptured by the impact of the gunshot. Uh, earlier, uh, one of the problems is that we saw, is trying to detect when anybody else was actually impacted by a gunshot. Uh, Governor Conley obviously is in anguish between frames 230 and 240 of the Zapruder film. The Warren Commission hypothesized that this was, could have been a delayed reaction. The actual impact could have been at an earlier point. Uh, some photogrammetric studies uh, indicated, for example, at frame 227, 228, uh, Conley's hat flips up. And we know that the bullet uh, struck Governor Conley in the wrist. Uh, it turns out at frame 224, 225, we see the flap of Governor Conley's uh, jacket, and the bullet went through the uh, front of his jacket. So we think that that is the point uh, that shows 
since it's followed in the sequence by the hat flipping up and then Governor Conley obviously in anguish that the point of impact was at 224, 225. And uh, the time lapse, the time interval between frame 224 and 313 is exactly 4.8 seconds. And so we have exact uh, correlation to our third shot here and our fourth shot here, which is the grassy knoll shot, the head shot. Uh, one more aspect of this that uh, uh, for the details you can look at this article. Uh, it came up during the House Select Committee's uh, questioning of the acoustical experts. They asked Professor Weiss if he could identify the sound uh, from the sound of the shot, from the signature, uh, what kind of rifle it was. And he answered yes that he could, but he'd, he'd rather not go there. And they asked him why, and he said because it got into some issues that were uh, non-acoustic, that he needed to know the path of the bullet, and if he knew the path of the bullet, he could calculate what kind of rifle it was, at least its uh, muzzle velocity, and uh, he'd rather not get into that. And of course the problem was, again, the legacy of the Warren Commission was that the House Select Committee decided that because the medical evidence, the Warren Commission had said that he was not shot in the head, there was no medical evidence for shot in the head from the, re from the front, that the shot from the front must have missed. Uh, of course, the, what we've heard uh, some yesterday and, and from the uh, filmed evidence showing the head going backwards, and I just showed you that uh, the correlation between the acoustical and video evidence, we would say that he was shot in the head, and therefore we do know the path of the bullet going from here to here, and from that we can calculate the muzzle velocity of the bullet. And what you use is the uh, shock wave of the, uh, the bullet itself, uh, because that's also picked up in the Dallas police tape, 24 milliseconds before the putative muzzle blast, you have an impulse that looks like a shock wave, and from that uh, you can extrapolate to calculate that velocity, uh, and you calculate to a muzzle velocity of 2,450 uh, feet per second, plus or minus about 90 feet per second. Uh, it turns out that if you look into a table, a uh, ballistics table, uh, 3030 Winchester has that velocity. And that brings us back to the acoustical evidence because of this broadcast that's also on the recording. Commission didn't go into that broadcast. So in conclusion, I uh, summarize what we have. There are five sounds on the police recording that had the acoustical characteristics of gunfire. Uh, all five suspect sound patterns match to the echo patterns of test shots fired in the plaza. Uh, the sequence and spacing, the order in the data is what convinced the uh, uh, acoustical expert to conclude that there were gunshots are on the recording. Uh, the sonar analysis by the second group uh, places it on the grassy knoll. Uh, the degree of match is statistically significant. Uh, films do show a motorcycle at or near at least the positions predicted by the acoustical evidence. That subject motorcycle had an, uh, a microphone relay problem. Uh, the suspect sounds were deposited on the recording simultaneous with the assassination if we use the uh, simulcast closest to the time of the assassination. The sequence of shots on the audio matches the video sequence of wounding, and the shockwave precedence matches to the muzzle velocity of 3030. And I thank you all very much for your attention. was whether or not there was a, evidence for a sixth shot. There is another sound pattern which is about a second ahead of the very first pattern. It, uh, I remember one of the characteristics that we were looking for is that it should have around 
uh, gunshot should produce around 10 impulses. Uh, this particular impulse on, uh, pattern only had four. So it would fail the first criteria, uh, one of the criteria. But then they put their brains to it and they thought, well, what if, what if it was just a pistol? And therefore not as loud as a rifle shot, they would capture fewer echoes. And that's the reason that they fired, uh, they had a pistol firing from the grassy knoll. Another uh, reason might be they thought, you know, the witnesses said that the rifle was sticking out of the window, but they thought, okay, well, what if the rifle for the first shot was withdrawn inside the window sill? Might that have muffled the sound and produced fewer large echoes? So they did that also. They fired test shots uh, with the rifle fired inside the building, and uh, they, they did not get a match when they did the comparison to the test shots. Well, yeah, you can you could throw. Um, yeah, we're we're trying to deal strictly with the evidence that we have, and test the hypothesis based on our observed data. To so. clarify that, would it, a silencer would affect the acoustical pattern. You wouldn't. Yeah, clearly you would. If you don't, <laughs> you're not going to have an echo pattern if you don't have a big blast. Uh, Don, um, David Wimp has has uh, pointed out that the 313 is blurred. Uh, I think one of your really dynamite arguments is the swiftness with which that blur occurs. In other words, at 312, nothing has happened. At, three, at 313, you have impact on Kennedy's head, but you also have a blurred frame, which means that the brooder has moved his camera. And I believe your argument takes the form of showing that if one assumes a shot came from the depository, the shock wave would not be there in time to produce that blurring, hence this is a separate indication of a shot of a firing point much closer to Zapruder than the sixth floor window. Would you summarize your argument? Uh, I well, I think you did argument. a pretty good job right there. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, for comparison, for example, the, the, the sound pattern at frame uh, that corresponds to frame 224, there's also a jiggle about frame 227 uh, that follows that. And if you make allowance for the speed of the bullet, the speed of sound, uh, that's exactly if a shot came from the book depository, that's when you would get the jiggle. So that, that corresponds. Conversely, the jiggle occurs much too fast to have come from the book depository. Uh, but if you simulate a shot from the, assume a shot from the grassy knoll, then the timing is just right. Was the Dow tax building uh, taken into consideration? Uh, when they fired these test shots, they were, uh, you remember, to do triangulation, you have to have two uh, points in your triangle known. What they were looking for, the third point in the triangle, was really the, my, the uh, motorcycle, the microphone. So they fired their test shots from the book depository because that's a known place. And then from the grassy knoll because known and respected, there was a lot of evidence for a shot from there. Uh, and that enabled them to triangulate onto the uh, to find the motorcycle. Once they found the motorcycle, then the second laboratory could go ahead and look for that shot from the, gra from the grassy knoll. But as far as firing a test shot from these other places, no, not, they had not done that. They were, weren't looking for. Now, there's a fifth shot, so there's a, there seems to be a rogue shot in there, and the question is, where does that come from? I have two observations, plus I wanted your comments. The first one, you mentioned that um, uh, Officer McLean was subsequently re-interviewed and said he did have a motorcycle with a stuck open mic. That's true, but the day after he testified, it was in the LA Times, uh, when Blakey said there was a four shot, 95%. Uh, the Officer McLean says, I do have a motorcycle with, an open, with a stuck open mic on occasion, but I didn't ride it that day. The guy on the Stimmons freeway rode it that day. The other one is, um, the, who was that guy that testified? Was it Wise or Arnosky? Okay, he said in effect that any of the four shots could also have been a false alarm. And it was, in other words, all these shots with all the acoustical stuff, the distance, the speed, and everything, any single one of them could have just as well, this as well been not only a shot, but it could have been a peck mark on a record. And he said it under questioning from Christopher Dodd, what's the chances of the four shot. In fact, what's the chance of any of the four shots being a false alarm or maybe a peck mark on a recording? And the answer was uh, 
one in five. So that's where Dodd came up with uh, uh, 80% times 95%, which equals 76%. So uh, your comments on that, please? Yeah, you're, uh, I'll start out with McLean. Uh, what I'll say about McLean's testimony, and he said other things too, which uh, uh, the idea that there was a conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination is kind of anathema to the Dallas police law enforcement. And when he testified, he didn't know what they were getting at. Uh, after he found out that they were using him to support the idea of conspiracy, he started backtracking. Uh, about a lot of things. As far as the uh, uh, the false alarm that Ashkenazi brought up, yes, there, anything you can imagine uh, that is random uh, could produce a uh, sound pattern and there's a finite possibility that you could, that that's what these are, it's a false alarm. It could be just static, uh, you know, there could have been something wrong with the circuitry of the motorcycle so that you would generate a pattern and any pattern uh, that's random can mimic any other pattern, so there's a finite possibility. Uh, what he was getting at with that, when he was talking about one chance in five, that he was talking about there is remember you got 36 shots, uh, so you got 36 opportunities. So even if it's a long shot that any one would match, heck, you got 36 chances. Multiply that times two uh, for the two different locations, and you have to factor that all in. That's why I went into a, a more formal statistical analysis to show that. Even if it were true that there was uh, a high probability that you could get a match, it would, not, it would be in random order. And that's that pattern I showed you how they were in order in the street. That's so the topological order matched the chronological order. That wouldn't have happened. And that's, that's also factored into the analysis. One, let me say one more thing. There's one other thing that uh, is hard to get around. The, uh, the, the Academy of Sciences said the chances that uh, a shot can sound the same as a peck mark is impossible. In other words, there's 66 peck, mar there's 66 peck marks on that tape. Any one of them you could uh, study if you were told it was a shot and you could come up with the, uh, the distance, the speed, and everything else of the shot. And in the, in the 20 seconds where the shots are most likely, there's, uh, there's 16 of those peck marks. And the National Academy said the idea that the peck marks and the shots sound exactly alike is impossible. How do you get around that one? Your comment, please. I'm not sure what you mean by a peck mark. I think well, you're peck talking marks about. Are when um, somebody was transcribing the um, recording. Oh, and they put scratches on. on. Yeah, yeah. The, the, and they keep turning the needle back and it makes a peck mark. That's what all those 66. Uh, sounds of static on, on the uh, uh, 90 seconds recording, and there's 16 specks of uh, static on the 20 seconds where the shots are most likely. Okay, I think you're, you're talking about the, the static marking rate was about eight per second. Maybe that's what you were getting at. And of course, any the yeah they were eroding the tape and you're getting scratches on there. But we're talking about impulses that are, are apart by uh, milliseconds. So you're not gonna drop or create uh, 10 peck marks within a, a space of uh, 100 milliseconds. Well, any of those 66 peck marks, if, he, if the scientists were told they were a gunshot, they could come up with the type of weapon used, the, dis the location of the weapon, and the speed of the bullet if they, if they assumed that those, any of those 66 peck marks were, um, um, were gunshots. Well, you've lost me because I don't know what you're talking about because that has what you're saying there has nothing to do with what I'm, what the acoustical experts were looking at here. You know that, uh, Robert Blake, he said this in an interview. He says we could not determine any of the shots from those sounds. We used a ten-point system that had nothing to do with acoustics. It had to do with the uh, the location on the tape and the the location between each pack marks, and we used a series of ten, which is not scientific at all, but is based on where the shots would be most likely to be. We took those tech marks based on a series of 10, and we, and we uh, put those for acoustical analysis. So they're doing an analysis on assumptions based on a series of 10, which is not scientific. You're, what you're talking about has absolutely nothing to do with what the acoustical experts did. And I've spoken to uh, Blakey a number of times, and I've never heard him say 
talk about tick marks or peck marks or whatever you're talking Have about. Have you heard that recording is yeah. discussion yeah. afterwards yeah. or if people get other questions? I mean, it's fair. I mean, you had about six or seven questions. Yeah, if anybody wants to debate with me, they can, I'll be here. You referred to the jiggling of the camera at, I think, 224 as well as at the time of the fatal shot. 28. 228, sorry. 227. I thought that actually it was even better than that, that, that the analysis of the film picking up the places where the Pruder jiggled the camera matched up, that the places where he jiggled the camera matched up with almost all of these impulses. Am I mistaken about that? No, they do. Right. They did. But you do have, you lose some resolution the further you get back because uh, the only places I know where you can actually pinpoint where somebody actually gets shot on the film yes. so that you know you have a, a shot is where you see Conley get hit and uh, where he flaps his lapel and where... But I think you're underestimating the significance of that because we're talking about a totally independent right. source of evidence sure. showing the same sequence of time points. That's the right. chances of that happening randomly are... Right. A visual, a visual confirming the audio. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, my, my second question, if I may, uh, there's recently been a story that there's some digitation and cleaning up the tape going on. Do you expect that to improve our, our knowledge about this at all? I wouldn't expect it to uh, add much to the acoustical evidence per se. What it might well do is give us a better context in terms of timelines, and uh, because the problem is the different playbacks, again, because of these recordings were stylus and groove arrangements, uh, whenever they play them back, you always get a skip, skips and repeats. Uh, so all the known playbacks are different from one another. Uh, this gives us a chance to play back the whole thing without any of those skips and repeats. And so I say maybe you'll have a better record of the broadcast and a, and a better timeline. As for these, uh, the impulses themselves, uh, the re you, what you can't get around is the, as the fellow mentioned, the more, this recording was not made for multiple playbacks. And so the more you play it, the more you erode uh, the impulses that are there. So I assume when they put that laser down the groove, it's gonna pick up the real, uh, the original divots as well as anything that's been added on there in the, in the meantime. Bob? Don? Uh, two things very quickly. Uh, Number one, which was the shot of the five? Which was the one that was eliminated of those five? The, the third. The third one. Thank you. And, and second of all, do you have Zapruder frame correlations for, the, uh, for those shots, for the five or six shots? Uh, from memory, I believe it was uh, 175, 202, 224, uh, 313, and then add seven-tenths of a second to come up with 325 or something in there. Thank you. Just to get a better perspective, were the two minutes before the time in question and two or three minutes after the time in question relatively acoustically flat uh, as far as the baseline goes? In other words, was that eight or ten seconds more active acoustically than the previous or subsequent time? In terms of the large impulses which they screened the first time, yeah, no, they found one about 17 seconds after this cluster, there was a, uh, no, I'm sorry, it was about 30 seconds after, but it lasted for, uh, I think, uh, uh, it, was, it was by itself and it was too long. And then towards the very end, about five minutes into the recording, there's another little uh, sequence of large Im impulses also. So there's, there is other places in the five and a half minutes where you can find large impulse trains, uh, but they n know where did they meet all four of those criteria except at that one, one place, 136 seconds into the recording. Thank you, Don. Uh, we'll now take a 10 minute break.
Here's what's ahead on C-SPAN. Next, more on the Warren Report and its legacy. We'll continue with a panel discussion on the lone gunman theory. And then a response to the conclusion.